Hello, everybody. Um, we had the honor of my interviewing uh, one of my favorite herbalists in North America, uh, Phyllis Light. Um, whenever you're around Phyllis, you're going to hear an accent. And it should be a very, that most friendly, wonderful accent that you, that only happens in the southern part of the United States, which, which is where she lives and where she op operates. Uh, and she's an she's a uh, exponent of southern folk medicine, uh, including the Ap Appalachians and the Ozarks, Indiana, Kentucky, Tennessee, where she actually sees clients online and maybe in person also. Isn't that right, Phyllis? Yes. And uh, uh, if you're ever looking for a good herbalist in that part of the country, uh, you can contact her and go to her website at www.phyllislight.com. It's Phyllis D. Light, P-H-Y-L-L-I-S-D-L-I-G-H-T dot com. We're going we're gonna to bring this up on, on, a, uh, on a separate slide so people will be able to see it. So Phyllis, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. Just um, glad that a lot of the COVID restrictions are over and we can get out again and ready ready to be a social creature and and uh, doing good. How about you? Well, at 83 years old, I think I'm doing darn good. I'm, or how old? 83. Oh my God! Yay! <laughs> and part of my legacy is is uh, is is uh, on, honor being honored by talking to all of my friends over the years and you're you're one of them we've been we've been known, known each other for many many years now many years at least 20 maybe longer and and uh i i meet phyllis at, often at various seminars around the country and uh, we always have to find a, a very special place to go off quietly and just talk about things and talk about herbs and 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 uh, compare notes and so forth. She's a really uh, top-rate herbalist. And well, thank you. So, Phyllis, I don't know what we're going to talk about. Certainly, one of the things that is kind of a, is really unique about you is this uh, whole, whole lineage of being a fourth-generation herbalist mm -hmm. and uh, having access to what seems to be a southern herbal tradition. Can you tell a little bit, a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so um, my grandmother, and this was on my daddy's side, um, was um, midwife and herbalist in um, part of the country here called Katega Valley. And my dad was an herbalist and wild crafter. And so I was started in the woods when I was 10 years old, helping gather herbs um, to sell, to market, or just to, for my granny to use. And um, so we started looking and she was taught by her mom and her grandmother and um, basically on my dad's side of the family, we could trace an herbalist uh, on herbal midwife back all the way back to the Civil War. So it's quite a long lineage in the family. So that that was my initial learning, as <laughs> my grandmother would say. <laughs> I'm going to learn you this. Um, anyway, <laughs> so um, that was my initial. Uh -huh. um, and by the time I was oh, 15, 16, um, my, uh, I'd kind of outgrown my, not really outgrown what my dad and my grandmother knew but had moved into there's got to be more there's got to be something else here you know and beginning to discover like I want to know why these work how does the body work you know so my grandmother was more about the herbs and definitely knew how the reproductive system worked but she never went to school my grandmother never went to school um she could read kind of um my grandfather my dad's father did go to school my dad only went to school in the winter time because <laughs> in the summer you know in the spring and the fall you had to be out working you know it was a, just a really poor area with a lot of poverty so um 
so there there wasn't any book learning this was all very traditional oral word of mouth passed on this is how the herbs work and this is what you do in this situation kind of stuff yeah that's really different from my my path in, a, in many ways i i didn't have anybody who would who even knew what the word what the word herbs meant <laughs> uh, so I, I basically uh had had to make it make it up as i went along uh, <laughs> I remember, I remember uh, I, I met up with Michael Moore, who I think it probably is the granddaddy of us all in, in a way, because uh, he was doing it before any of us even thought of it. And I see that literally. Um, and I saw him in Topanga Canyon in this little uh, kind of festival in a typical type of herb shop with things hanging around and on the herbs hanging in bunches around and stuff. This big burly guy sitting there and, and uh, he and I, I just kind of went walked around there because I, I was a beatnik at the time and, and I looked around and, he, and he, 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 over the years, he constantly joked that I must have stole some, something out of his shop and I, I didn't. Uh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, I might have, but I, I didn't because I couldn't relate to any of it. So I started when it, at least with, with the hate Ashbury movement moving there and people were using a golden seal for everything because that was, mm. we were basically trying to become self sufficient. And then we moved to a commune called Black Bear Ranch, and that's where the plants literally grabbed me by the seat of the pants. And, mm. and uh, coming from an Italian family, my mother always had a little spat part of the place wherever we lived, patch that she gave me to grow things in. So I love I love growing things. I love plants when I was a kid and nature. And, and even though growing up in Los Angeles, there wasn't that much nature around. Mm. That's where I started, and there were just a handful of books back to Eden, uh, uh, the herbalist, a you know, handful of books to learn from. I just thumbed through them, and if I could identify one herb in a day, I thought I, I really did something. So, wow. So my path was very different from yours, and and uh, as far as schooling goes, I didn't have any. I, I learned acupuncture from uh, somebody at Black Bear who, who learned it from somebody in England, and and, uh, and we would. We, we would experiment experiment on each other uh, on naked bodies in geodesic domes up in up in the mountains, and, and uh, <laughs> okay, uh, that's where I first learned acupuncture. And uh, so now, lo and behold, here I am starting herb schools and uh, trying to trying to uh, uh, main, like you, trying to maintain standards in the practice of herbal medicine, the standards that didn't exist before us, but we would like to see uh, be, be be present. So yes. you say that uh, you went with your grandfather and gathered herbs in the mountains or your uncle? I went with my, my dad and my uncles and sometimes my grandfather went. Um, what herbs did you gather? Well, initially ginseng because ginseng was like cash money. Um, so so we always gathered ginseng and, uh, you know, and, and it how, was. A, how much would you get? How much? How much would you get in those days when you get Oh, it? I remember when we thought six hundred dollars a dry pound was a massive, massive amount. Mm -hmm. um, so and that, and it was awesome. back in those days. Um, but anywhere from two to six hundred, depending on the market. But it, you know, the market changed. So when we first started gathering, or when my family was gathering for a long time, um, you could you always farm the forest you know so there there were these wild patches that we carefully tended and took care of and by that i mean that we harvested sparingly because you always wanted to keep the population growing right. so we never harvested until the red berry was on top right and then we replanted the berries and also we broke off the arm uh -huh. which generally had leaves attached and we immediately replanted that back into the ground would and that, then we would that grow again yes huh. nine times out of ten that will grow again um because it has little rootlets on it now mm -hmm. if it doesn't have the little rootlets maybe not but it, you would break off the ones with little rootlets and the older the plant the more likely there'd be little rootlets on the arm mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Harvest the ginseng as to supplement or to actually as a major income, but uh, did they actually take it also? 
Yes, totally. Did totally. They know, they know how, to, how would they take it? Well, it, generally as a tea or you just chewed it raw. I mean, and so I, I was chewing ginseng raw by the time I was 10. It, it's like so much part of my body now. <laughs> God. But, right. It's like here, just chew some ginseng or here, make some ginseng tea. Um, you know, my dad thought ginseng cured everything. And could, you know, he would say, you know, boil it if you're really sick, if you just want to like help yourself stay better, you know, just pour some hot water on it, let it sit. So he had different cooking times for whatever he thought ailed, you know, was ailing people at the time. So cooking times. Yeah. You know, so like, you know, you put it, you know, kind of chop it up or break it up and you put it in a pot and you uh on the stove and bring it to a boil uh -huh. and then reduce it to a simmer well simmer it for five minutes for this or simmer it 30 minutes for that really what would be the difference in terms of how long you cooked it um as far as taste it's going to be a whole lot more bitter well, as far as as far as its medicinal properties any change in that oh yeah um the more bitter it got, the more digestive activity it seemed to have. And I know people don't tend to think of um, American ginseng as a digestive aid, but when you really bring that bitterness out, you could just you can just like feel your gallbladder go coink. And you just feel that things moving through your gut. Um, so it definitely was considered a cleanser. The more bitter it got, when it, when it was cooked slower. Or, or less, uh, I, I would imagine there's more volatile oils in it. I don't, yep. I don't, I don't even, I, I, I know that there's supposed to be volatile oils in, in ginseng, but I never really studied it. So uh, I'm not sure about, about all and, that. And I think the more immune activity it might have, um, yeah. the less you cook it also. Really? Yeah, I think it's much more supportive of um, the stress you know, um, you, know how the, you know how the Chinese cook cook ginseng. No, I don't. They have a thing called a ginseng cooker, and it's actually like like a double boiler. And it's a hmm. ceramic, ceramic pot, and uh, you put and you, and you and you put that pot in a in a pot of boiling water, and 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 you're cooking the ginseng in this double pot in this double boiler situation. So you're actually ca capturing all the and you cut the whole thing is covered. So you're ca capturing all the volatile oils along with the uh the bitter ah oh, okay so uh, i have a couple of those uh ginseng pots but i have i've hardly used them very many times <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but that's how they that's how they would cook tonics and uh so what kind of a what what, are, what other kinds of herbs were do you all, all uh gather in the woods gather in the woods and what, what um, are for them uh pink root was another big one what was that used for? Um, mostly parasites. Um, oh, spagilia, isn't it? Spagilia, yeah. Um, it's uh, another kind of bitter one. And um, beautiful flower. I mean, it's like you should grow it in your garden. It's so beautiful. Oh, I should get some. But yeah, it's, it's gorgeous. I have a... Uh, uh, Terrible success trying to grow ginseng in my garden, even though I have I have a shade cover. It just doesn't doesn't take the same thing with golden seal. I suppose you had golden seal where you lived also. On the edge of golden seal, and truthfully, by the time even I was a little girl, golden seal was getting over harvested. Right. It was hard to find. It was hard to find in the woods. Yeah, the hit um, Ashbury. That was second to marijuana. Golden seal was their was their medicine. <laughs> and they would take it for every kind of infection that you could imagine. And it had, as far as I could tell, it, it was like a, a mixed bag as to how many infections it actually cured. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I think I think golden seal works for deeper kinds of things that involve liver, deeper, deeper systems in the body. But I think echinacea works really, really fantastically well for uh, infections. I do too. I mean, that would be my go to. Um, is echinacea and uh, in the 
like south of me, we have the Alabama, Alabama Prairie. I live up in the hills and the mountains and just, you know, a couple hours south of me, it moves into the Black Belt or the Prairie. And so Echinacea did grow wild here. Yeah. Um, and so, several different species. I guess you had Angustifolia too? Yeah, we did. Um, and they are now, I know there's a University of West Alabama is now experimenting with bringing it back into the prairie lands there. That's good. Yeah. So and, Echinacea, yeah. my go-to over Golden Seal. Oh, for sure. Yeah. It's, and and, and uh, you have other species of Echinacea there too. I think you have the, the, the white one as well. And we have the green one. Um, we have yeah i don't know the the latin names on those but yeah offhand, but do, they, do you think they all have similar properties i do i do think they have very similar properties um they seem like some are more heating some are more cooling in the body but they both tend toward infection and of course we have black eyed susan um which was used too you happen to know offhand i, I, I can't always remember those things with the latin for black eyed susan it's a Rubecchia. Rubecchia, um, of course. All right. Never, right. No, what would you use it for? Um, pretty much the same thing you would Echinacea. It was just so much easier to find uh -huh. um, because Black Eyed Susan grew wild at the cemetery. It grew wild in the woods. It, you know, it it was just a uh, really prolific. Where the wild Echinacea was a bit harder to find. And, you know, and my grandmother and my great aunts did cultivate some uh, plants in their yard, in their garden. Um, so they did cultivate some echinacea. And um, my great aunt, Jewel, Julie, she cultivated a plant she called, um, uh, um, what does she call that? Uh, multi, multi floor multi-thorn or something like that i i can't even remember it was multi-something oh, and do you have any pictures of your family back in those days um i've got a picture of my grandmother um i got a picture of me and my dad probably be fun to see those at some point if they're, if they're handy but anyway yeah they're on my computer i, I can pull them up before we okay we, we finish um but anyway i later learned that um, that plant was yarrow. Oh, <laughs> but but she called it um, a multi fern because of the thousands of little fern like leaves on it. I mean that, and so it wasn't until I I gosh I don't even know I was like in my forties, and somebody said, "Oh, I've got yarrow." I was up in the northeast, and I was like, "Where? What's yarrow?" And they were like that. And I went, what? <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's multi <-fern. laughs> Good. So. Do, do, you, do, you, do you use it and did your aunt use it? Just for a first aid, it was not a big or commonly used plant because it had to be planted. It wasn't wild here. Yeah. Yeah. And it's got awful bitter. It's terrible tasting. Uh, people people wow. wax. wax great praise on, on these herbs like yarrow and I and I have not used it that much because it tastes so damn bad I mean it does it has a it has an oiliness to the bitterness that yeah, yeah. we used to we used to, to pride ourselves when we first began as to how bitter we, we could take the bitter herbs I, I, yeah I, I don't know if you ever did that we used to always say oh I can take drink this bitter and we drink it and, and not never even grimace now when I'm older, I can't stand it. <laughs> <laughs> well, growing, with myself. <laughs> you know, growing up chewing on ginseng, that is like pretty darn bitter. So it, it ginseng to be that bitter, but that's all right. Yeah. So I you know, I grew up not minding bitter because I just chewed on bitter herbs. Uh, you know, all the worming medicines were bitter and they were all really big into worming and should have been because everybody was running around barefooted you know people it was just you know an area of poverty and there were a lot of parasites you know you run barefooted down to the barn oh and my god yeah that's gosh that's the capital of parasites down there 
Yeah, I remember in the sixth grade. I mean, every never, year. Never with California. <laughs> All right. Every year the school nurse came around and gave us a lecture on how not to get parasites. I mean, they were just so, so common. Curiosity, since I haven't treated that many parasites, how would you how would you treat? Well, if it's a, a really serious infestation, I'm just like go to the doctor and get the real the strong stuff. Um, because the herbal stuff has to be actually extracted so it's that strong. You just can't take a little black walnut and think you're going to get rid of a parasite right. it's just not going to happen um and and so um like thymol which is an extract of you know the chemical uh extract of oregano and thyme and thymol it, it has to be extracted so strong it actually just makes you horribly sick at your stomach to take yeah. it but um, that's how long it how strong things have to be to get rid of the parasites right. yeah, I, yeah. I, uh, i'm with you on that there, there are some things that i would just say uh, i'm not going to bother with the herbs here just go to the doctor and get, get whatever. it's just you know what it's just going to piss them off the herbs are just going to kind of like piss them off um you know um you have to to get rid of the parasites you have to like not eat um, for days like fast so there's no food going in and then you have to like extract the herb super strong you have to make sure when they take the herb um, that it's actually a syrup because almost all parasites are after the glucose or after the sugar right, right. right so that so you starve yourself for four days and you make this super strong bitter herbal mixture syrup and then the parasites go suck it up because they're starving um and then you might run them out all right and then it might paralyze them and run them out but it doesn't kill them yeah i have a suspicion that almost almost any bitter herb is going to help help get rid of parasites but you have to stop feeding them the sweet stuff that's right you do i, uh, I uh my, my most stunning case of parasites was a ranger who worked in yellowstone who had a, a, amoebas uh, that he got from the water there mm. and and uh so i told i told him that he had to eat only brown rice for a week because brown rice is a neutral food and i was very much into macrobiotics then it, it's meaning it doesn't it doesn't do anything to imbalance the, the metabolism of the body it's not it's not it doesn't turn into a sweet like sure like other kinds of rice does so you eat only brown rice maybe some beans also but uh but for one week and uh then he had to take two capsules of golden seal double lock capsule of golden seal every two hours while he's awake i know that's a lot of golden seal but uh for, for one week uh it didn't cause any problems and then eat lots of garlic at the end of the week they were all gone so it, it was, it's that kind of a heroic a approach i think that has to be taken when you're going it, it you know, does i agree it absolutely you, does you got all the artemisias which are god awful bitter Mm -hmm. I would use those in a minute, but can you can you, you probably want to put them in capsules or find some way to get get them down? Absolutely, absolutely so, capsules for me. <laughs> Cut. So, um, did you know Catfish Gray? I knew of him. He was over in the South Carolina, um, that part of the country. Yeah, That's where I met him. North Carolina. Yeah, I think it was in the north. Of South. I, I, I was I, in North Carolina, so I met him somewhere in the woods there. I, I don't know if I was. In okay, South. maybe it was North Carolina, um, but it's over in that kind of area. And I knew of him, and I know, I knew at that time people who had gone to him, um, but I never met him. Did you have an opinion about his work? What, what he did? Um, I thought it was okay. Um, but I didn't think he was near as good as Tommy Bass was, but I never met him. You, you, hung, you hung out, hung out with Tommy Bass. Yeah. Um, for one of the several great years. Appalachian Ozark herbalists, I think. Yeah. Um, okay. very, very famous Southern Appalachian herbalist. And, oh, um, I never, I have never met anyone, anyone, including people like Seven Song who can take you into the woods and know the names of more plants and how to use them than Tommy, probably four or 500 plants, easy. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, he was phenomenal. Wasn't and he, he knew he educated in other ways as well. He uh he was his mother taught him, he didn't go to school, but his mother taught him to read using the Bible. Uh, and he would and he read quite a bit. And then he when Tommy was, I think he was five. Um, Aunt Molly Kirby, who is the black midwife that lived down at the foot of the mountain and Tommy and his family lived up on top. Um, she got too old to go up and down the mountain. And so she hired him to start gathering herbs for her right. and in the woods. So and then he we would say became her apprentice back in those days. The concept of apprentice wasn't quite the same as it is now. Mm -hmm. Right. But he worked with her until she retired. He was not allowed to deliver a baby or to do anything related to women. Right. Um, you know, that was that time period. Everything was very separated. But, um, you know, he learned a tremendous amount. But Tommy's mom and dad uh, were second generation herbalist also. So he had this English folk tradition that he grew up with and his um, dad and his mom both saw clients in the area too. So it was just like a real true fusion of, of cultures and systems coming together with right. Tommy, you know, that true Southern fusion. Right. Many, many people think that when you talk about herbal, herbal healing, like it's one thing, it's not one thing in America. And it's no. not one thing in China, believe it or not, even though we call it we call it traditional Chinese medicine as if it's one thing, but there are many, many different sub subgroups, Taiwanese and and oh. uh, different different styles of how how it's practiced in different parts of the country. And the same thing in, in North America. And and you, Phyllis, are the, the, the representative of southern uh, of folk medicine. And I understand there's some some uh, Scottish background in terms of their bringing that in and and uh, either you put together or you inherited a system that was that was a uh, past that was used or that you used. I, I, maybe you right. can talk a little bit about that. That has yeah some rela some relationship to how Chinese and Ayurvedic and other have, have developed a system. Well, you that? know, I I codified and or put down on paper and codified a system that I was taught orally, and it was really based on. Uh, the uh, our relationship to the land and so you know my grandmother had native american ancestry so that was part of it and you know there was the scots irish you know um the south was settled about a hundred years before the northeast so even before there were um Plymouth Rock even existed in the concept of people settling there. The Spanish had been in the South about a hundred years. Mm -hmm. So we had that influence of the Spanish here. And many of the place names in South Alabama are actually people go, oh, is that Native American? No, that's Spanish. Um, you know, just from that time period where, where the Spanish um, lived here and try to set up little colonies. Um, so that was an immediate interaction. So you have Native American concepts, philosophies, how to use herbs. You know, so um, so many of our plants we know about because Native American shared the uses of the plants. So um, you guys are friends then. It wasn't secret knowledge, you know. Um, the, the Indians were actually helpful. They were they were they were help, they were friends with the with the settlers at that point. Well, I would say it was a matter of survival because 90% of the ones in the South were dead um, due to, I mean, 90% wow. of Native Americans in the South died uh, within just a few years uh, of the Spanish arriving uh, due to European diseases. So that's huge. That's a huge number. Right. It, it was almost genocide. So, you know, I think what people don't understand is that this is how you survive. And who now do you marry? Well, here's a settler over here and he has a daughter and there's nobody else for a hundred miles because everybody's dead. So there was a lot of intermarriage um, between natives of 
all tribes and the settlers there was basically nobody else and then there you have this exchange of information that takes place and now your family and it takes place in this process so um it was a matter of survival more than just being helpful right, right. You, know, you, you gotta live so how so how, how does your the system work can you tell a little bit little bit about that yeah it's um based on um four elements and that's something that came from the scottish everywhere <laughs> well native americans had four elements um cherokee and creeks had four elements and all four elements had to be in in creek medicine my which my grandmother's ancestry is creek um all four elements had to be present in every herbal formula. What were the elements? Um, oh. Earth. Yeah, earth, water. Air, fire. So where did they get that from? Do you have any idea? I, I only assume it's their relationship with the land and observing nature because, you know, it's the way I was taught. If it's hot and dry outside, um, and remember at this time period everybody's living in intimate contact with nature there's no air conditioning at all houses are not bug proof or snake proof right um my mother grew up with a in a house that was not bug proof nor snake proof and it had a dirt floor and no running water no electricity that was just the norm so you lived in very intimate contact with nature if it was hot and dry outside then your your body was going to be hot and dry because you weren't separate right right from nature so i just see that four elements is kind of a natural progression and then creek medicine wind or air is the only element that has intelligence no, it's somewhat like ayurveda then it can walk and move uh -huh. and think it can think wind yeah. can think and wind was the only element that had children can you uh off just offhand I, I know we're not there's no preparation for this talk when we, when we're no not. we're just talking right but i wonder if you could uh if you could identify any any particular plants that you might use for each of these elements when you see them in, in balance what, what would the imbalance look like and what kind of plant would you would you go through towards or would you want any formulas well, sometimes formulas, and there's always four, maybe five herbs in a formula, you know, one for each element, maybe a binder. Um, and if I use a formula, but what's, I'll give you, a, uh -huh, a, go ahead. What's a binder? A binder is a potentiator. It makes the formula work better. And there's some specific plants in Southern folk medicine that are considered, you know, binders or potentiators. Uh, smart weed cayenne obviously i got that as a weed all over my garden i didn't know i didn't have i never used that before. oh my god <laughs> um smart weed um i don't know which one you have the most common one here is the the pennsylvania smart weed uh -huh. it's about two and a half feet tall or so what do you use that for um number one kidneys um super popular kidney remedy um and it helps like jump start the kidneys when they're feeling weak and tired so smart weed and traditional southern formula kidney formulas was almost always in there um either as the principal herb or at least as a potentiator um it's a lymphatic it moves the lymph around the body um, it makes an amazing foot soak that you can actually feel in your body. So real traditional. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize that, that you don't have to ingest herbs through your mouth. Uh, That's right. If your body needs it, and I've seen this many, many times, you can just soak your hands and your feet in it like twice a day or apply it to the fomentation of the skin. And your, your body takes it in exactly the right dose. That's <laughs> it. That's it. it. So you make it strong so your body can decide how much it wants. <laughs> <laughs> so smart weed was kind of like number one use was in a foot soap to move everything in your body to activate your kidneys to move your lymph, get everything going and it's any part above the ground. So how would how would somebody identify that they had weak kidneys? 
lack of energy, lack of motivation, you dragging, don't, you know, dragging, not feeling good, anemia, um, joint pain, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All, the, all those things, you know, you know, and this is weak kidneys, not kidney infection, right? right? Right, which were considered two different things. You wouldn't use, you wouldn't use smart wheat for a kidney infection. Um, um, maybe as a potentiator to drive the formula, you know, to the kidneys, but um, it might be a, a little strong. Right. Right. Yeah, Ayurveda uses a, I, I, I forget what the name of that, the, the type of an herb that takes takes other herbs to the air part of the body. It's, um, okay. Uh, there's a name for that, but I can't, it doesn't come to my mind right now. Similar to Southern folk medicine. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, what would you use for, for bladder infections and how effective was it? Well, depends on the symptoms. If it was just irritated green corn silk might be useful and there's always a lot and it's got to be green corn silk brown corn silk i don't even know how that got popular in the herbal business it's dead mm -hmm. honey it's brown it's dead there's nothing there um so how do you when you when you get corn silk it's always going to be brown because it's dried right no green corn silk dries grain okay all right yeah so and it is active it's okay. totally active um crunchy sweet nutritious um, it's an active plant where brown corn silk is dead it's dead i'm i'm playing the, i'm playing the part of the of the, the stupid interrogator you know when i say when i ask phyllis what would you use for this disease <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know you know <laughs> you no know, no people dump that onto, onto me all the time but according to the point of it is is that uh it's pretty hard to say one herb is going to be good for that disease all the time because it's going to be good for that person for that disease but it also has to be good for the person right right and otherwise otherwise it may not work at all that's so, right so uh i don't know we uh, i guess i guess our a go-to herb up here in northern california would be uh, uh princess pine pipsisawa and uh, uh uber Ursi. Well, I definitely would use Pipsisawa. You know, now I might recommend Uva Ursi, but back in the day, of course, it didn't grow here. So you have smart weed. Pipsisawa grows everywhere. Goldenrod is really, really good for a UTI. I recommend that one quite often. Um, Princess Pine. Right. Princess Pine? That's another name for it, Princess Pine. Uh, I, I don't know if it's prince or princess. I think I think it's prince. I think it's princess. I don't know, but I, I remember that grows all over the forest in, in Northern California, and I can go up and pick a a, a, a bushel of it off the forest floor. And uh, interestingly enough, the, the Karak Indians used it for congestive heart failure. At least I used to pick it for for a, a hundred year old my spiritual grandmother, Karak Indian woman who lived, lived there. And she'd take, she take, I'd, I'd bring her back these big gunny sack full of, of princess pine. She'd stuff it all into a pot and just boil the living daylights out of it and then can it. Now, yeah, my grandmother canned herbs too. That was yeah. just a really common way to keep them. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. I never heard of anybody else but her doing that. And she, yeah. She'd can it and she'd drink like a, a quart a day until until her, her congestive heart failure was resolved and, and that and she lived, lived to, on to over 100 years old uh, her name was bessie smith and uh she was wonderful yeah. but but princess pine is used a lot for urinary conditions but it has many other uses as well right i might also recommend sumac again yeah. depending on the person and the symptoms right so a lot of the herbs that grow in the Appalachians and Ozarks are not even commercially available. Mm, they used to be, because they used to be, you know, the most common herbs, but now we're kind of like down to just a small number of herbs that they're selling on the market. Some mm. companies still uh, sell some of these, um, or at least in formulas. There are a few of the companies that have been 
around a while. And if you go on to Etsy, there are quite a number of boutique um, foragers that yeah. will get them get it for you. Right. We charge a lot of money for that stuff, though. <laughs> <When you're, laughs> yeah, <laughs> they can. Yeah, it's best to know somebody in the area and have them pick, pick it for you. But that's one of the, the big issues, I think, is that people say they want to use local herbs, they want to use North American herbs, but heck, you know, you, they're, not, they're not commercially available. Ones that were common back even in the 60s and the, are, are, are no longer, you know, find on market because it's all commercially driven. You know, whatever yeah. is famous and, 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 you, and you can you sell a lot of that. And that's, that's basically what, what, and the rest just falls into obsolescence. And, yeah, it's almost impossible to find Stolingia anymore. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Stolingia used to be so important. Yeah. Did you, did you harvest that at all? It, it grows a little bit where I'm at, but it grows further south. So, you know, you know, I'm, I make a foraging trip a little south of me. Mm -hmm. um, but it is getting hard to find in areas where it used to be plentiful. I, I don't know if it's being over harvested for the few companies that still use it or if it's the environment has just changed so much the climate that it's just not growing the way it used to grow. So there's a there's a predicament. Uh, we know we know that uh, the Chinese herbs are very very available, and you can get a, an assortment of three, four, five hundred different Chinese herbs on the market right now in, in, in Western lands. You can't get that kind of that, that kind of abundance of North American herbs. Now let's keep in mind that the reason why North America was discovered was looking for plant medicine. That's right. That was the biggest deal. The, the first, the, the, every time they'd find a plant, they'd find a use for it and they'd send it back to Europe and Europe would, would figure out how to use it and then they'd, they'd start promoting it. And now that's all fallen by the wayside and, uh, and, and people have to look across the other side of the world to find an abundance of herbs. So with that dilemma and somebody wanted to treat themselves using North American herbs, do you have any suggestions? I'm well, you, you know, there there are some foragers. I mean, if, if somebody really needed some herbs, I know quite a few foragers in the area. And there's quite a number of folks in North Carolina around the Asheville that are either growing native plants or can ethically forage them. So I do I do feel like there's a market potential there. Right. Um, it's just, you know, connecting people to the the companies to the people who are doing this. So right and companies like Herb Farm, they they utilize these foragers. I think Gaia does too. They utilize these foragers to make their products. They do. And Gaia the, definitely grows a lot and then accepts foragers too. So and that's, and that's great. But then then they're sold a lot in one ounce bottles. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and and uh, so it gets down to dosage. Then, I don't yeah, know about, I don't know about you, but I use high doses. I depends depends on the situation, the person, and the herb. Sometimes I do higher doses. Sometimes I do uh, lower doses. Sometimes I do medium doses, like you say, every two hours, um, depending on you know, is it acute, is it chronic, you know, what's going on. So. Um, and if a person is really weak, sometimes a high dose can just kind of like overwhelm processes that are, are already not working well. And so starting low and working up might be more appropriate sometimes too. So I just do it by the situation in the moment yeah. with the person. That's one of the things with Ayurvedic medicine when it, when it first was introduced in this country, uh, the people who practice Ayurvedic herbalism would, would prescribe such low doses and everybody thought it was somehow because it was because it was affiliated with yoga and spirituality and all that stuff that basically this was the this was the, the thing to do and it, it must be helping them even though it did nothing <laughs> but when you actually get right down to it ayurvedic medicine is is actually the most down-to-earth medicine i know i mean they literally make this stuff sitting on the dirt grinding <laughs> right, <stuff. laughs> right. And 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 they and they take substantial doses, 
And mostly, mostly powders of herbs are, are used in Ayurveda. And how about in, the, in your area? Of course, um, the tools to power them. You know, so in my area, there, there were different tinctures to start with. And maybe here's a difference in, in why lower doses sometimes work better. Because alcohol was prohibited. I mean, I, didn't, I couldn't even buy alcohol in my town until about five years ago. I had to travel so you know we're still operating under but uh, prohibition but also the you know christians didn't drink and it's a heavily fundamentalist christian area in the south and it's only recently that that alcohol has become available uh, and considered okay by churches for people to drink people just didn't drink so there's no alcohol so the tradition has always been really strong extracted decoctions not teas decoctions and that were so strong so bitter and so dark you only needed a sip or two and that's that was all your stomach was going to handle um you know super extracted uh, and if it if there was a special case where you needed an alcohol extraction. Well, it was somebody's homebrew that you were getting to make an alcohol extraction. And that was really rare. So, you know, the system I was taught, everything is like super decocted. I mean, I can't think of anything that wasn't, you know, simmered, brought to a boil and simmered for at least 20 minutes. And, you know, that really changes the concept of what's in the or in the decoction, you know, um, it's well, strong medicine, right? Well, it's really strong medicine. Well, uh, you also have an, another herb that, that I, I happen to love a lot, um, which is sassafras. Yes. All over the place. It's, yeah. And it's delicious. What do you use it for? That's an interesting question. So <laughs> it is an interesting question um, because, you know, we have all the, the legal aspects of don't, you know, sassafras has several and, you know, it's oil extracted. So you don't make tinctures out of it um, because it can damage the liver. Does it really damage the liver? We don't know, but generations and generations of Appalachians drank it but it was a decoction not a tincture again so form may make the difference um so root was used um for i'm sorry what was what was it the root the root was used yeah yeah the root was used to um balance hormones so any change change of life for women so it was sassafras tea was drank after childbirth to clamp down the uterus and to stop baby blues it was a drink for baby blues back in the day that's a postpartum depression huh? yeah. yeah postpartum boy, depression that, that can be hell yeah imagine that you, you have your whole life being fulfilled by having a baby but you got to be depressed about it it's terrible it, it is and you know it's the just the change in hormones so um yeah. sassafras does act on the liver but it acted on the liver in this case to help process those hormones that were you know it takes three months to if you're breastfeeding you you have elevated hormones for six to nine months yeah. uh, right and so it helped balance the hormones. It was a menopausal remedy. If you're going hot flashes, get rid of your hot flashes, sassafras root tea. Um, it was also used to um, um, any kind of liver dysfunction. It was used for blood pressure problems. And um, I have occasionally used it for that. Um, but for some people, and it's a constitutional, I've seen sassafras root decoction or to bring down blood pressure but it then as somebody else i've seen it raise it so i have to be very constitutionally aware of blood pressure when i when i have recommended it in the past um leaves eaten green um were to give you dreams and if you had you know to give you dreams if you have 
had a problem in your life and you wanted to dream a solution, you ate a green sassafras leaf. So people would, um, you know, keep some green ones around. You know, this is one of the old super, you know, station magical uses of plants that are here in the South. Um, you know, if you dry it, you got filet, a filet gumbo. And it was used in cooking, dried leaves are used in cooking. And, huh? Still is. Still is. And thickened up, you know, helped thick up gravies and sauces. Um, and so it was, you know, like the whole plant could be used. Um, now they're kind of shrubby plants. But back in the day, and I've only seen this a couple of times, sassafras trees get like 100 feet tall or taller yeah. and they can be 15 20 feet around they're huge and the root bark can be like this wow, wow. We're on them wow. you know so so when the settlers came and they were shipping sassafras roots back to england and europe as medicine that's what they were shipping these giant roots i always thought of it as being warming what do you think? It is definitely warm and it has a, a cinnamon like smell. Right. And it hot. It smells hot. I also think of it as North American cinnamon. Yeah. Well, it pretty much is. Um, I would say it has a lot of similar properties, but it's oilier. I would say it's oilier than true cinnamon. Um of course the cinnamon oil is oil is extracting cinnamon too. So yeah, well, I was just thinking of the bark versus the root and what was in the root well i i think i think sassafras is like many herbs that, that we have growing in north america is very underutilized because people don't understand it right and uh if if uh, if i had if, if i didn't have any other choices and, and because cinnamon is like a really important herb in chinese medicine because it, it treats the surface it treats arthritic problems and uh, and, and, and it nourishes the yin, which is your ability to digest and assimilate nutrients at a very deep level. And it's uh, really, really important for warming. And, and, the, yes. and the thicker the cinnamon bark is, the hotter it is, mm. like, just like sassafras. So if I, if I didn't have cinnamon to, to work with, I would use sassafras. But then you'd have to figure out where, you, where are you going to get quality sassafras? It's going to be thick bark. Right. Those, those trees are down now. So, right. So what we have are a lot of little shrubby trees that grow along fence lines that maybe get 15, 20 feet tall before they cut them again. So, uh, but even on a small um, shrubby sassafras, the root bark is very pungent. Yeah. Um, you know, it's very hot smelling. Um, it was also used as a stimulating herb to move the blood, like right? moves the blood and also considered a supreme blood cleanser Same you know well so do but uh so yeah it, it's a it's a bit of a dilemma can, do you have your book handy by the way yeah i do can you show it and i'll show the book show you the book i have in my hand so this is uh phyllis light's book uh it's one of a kind. There's not. There's not another one like this. Southern folk medicine, where she's talking about her heritage and, and what she's what she's learned from uh, living living in that part of the country, and I highly recommend it. Now I'll show you the one I have, which is also. <laughs> Can you see it all right? That no, way? it's not coming through for some reason. How about now? Mm, oh, I can see Tommy. That's it. It's Tommy Bass's book. Yeah. Written by uh, Daryl Patton called yep. Mountain, Mountain Medicine. And, this and was, I, I actually wrote the forward to that. And, and Phyllis wrote the forward, of course. Uh, she, this is one of your teachers, right? Right. One of my teachers. And so I, under, I, I know, know after talking to you that you know a lot about Chinese medicine. Not too much, no. No. A little, you know, picked up here and there, but never made a study of it. I, th I think we've had we've had congruent conversations where you showed, yeah. showed me that you understood Chinese medicine pretty well. Okay. You just didn't, you just maybe are not 
that familiar with all the herbs and formulas which we use but that's true you know i'm the, not you know the principles very well because they're very yes. similar and this is what this is what why, why i posited this idea a long time ago and people actually objected to it of planetary herbalism somehow, i love that concept somehow you know you can call it whatever global herbalism call it whatever you like but the idea is that uh we don't we no longer live in one part of the world we live on many places right now i'm in northern california and phyllis where are you now in alabama alabama and uh and i have students in different parts of the world and, we, and we're exposed to all these different influences of, of wisdom and things that never that were never available to people before except what was, what was only local to them and we, we can't expect to uh find one way uh that is going to work for everybody in any one place because we're all from different places we all have different influences and so that, that whether we like it or not there's going to be a, a, a fusion of, of these systems and where i started from was the realization that almost every herbal system in the world that has any integrity understands hot and cold yes you know hot cold wet and dry right and uh you find that in south america central america in the appalachians in China and in, in traditional Western herbalism back, back into Greco-Roman times. So I kind of thought to myself, well, maybe maybe there was like a time when this was a universal wisdom in the world. I yeah. think it is because it's based on the land. This is what the land does. Yeah, and I'm kind of imagining that maybe the gods, whoever they were, came down and, 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 and imparted this to the human race and said, for you. this is to help you while you're, while you're going through all your challenges trying to live there <laughs> <laughs> while you're learning and growing well phyllis i think this has been a great conversation uh i i would i could probably carry on another couple hours with you easily but uh unfortunately unfortunately i think our, our viewers would, would tire uh even though we'd be very entertained yeah we would totally be happy <laughs> i so, could talk to you forever so uh, you have any last words that you would like to say about yourself and about whatever you're doing and things like that? Well, I would, I just want to say that the principles of Southern folk medicine aren't just for people in the South. It's like you're saying, anybody can use them. Um, I think Southern folk medicine is really easy for um, English speakers to learn because it's based on a vocabulary you already know. Um, there's no special words in it. It's based on a, a very common vocabulary. Um, so it's easy to pick up. I um, also think that Southern folk medicine does have a great emphasis on uh, native herbs, but doesn't exclude the use of any other herbs be because oddly at the settlement of this country, um, because we had such, in especially the 13 colonies, uh, I mean, cinnamon was already being traded here in this country by 1550. And so was cloves and so was nutmeg and so was rosemary. So the the herbs and spices we might think of as being not native, they were in a lot of traditional original formulas because they were already here mm -hmm. um they came with the settlers and you know of course up in the northeast england forced the colonists to buy them um you know you have to buy these as a matter of fact um i have um quite a number of hindu clients in huntsville and um the hindi word for five mm -hmm. is is punch punch so the original colonial punch had five spices in it. Oh, punch and punch are the same. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Punch, and punch of karma is like a cleansing, five cleansing methods. And it it's the, the yeah. Oh my goodness. Wow. What a what a connection. Yeah, it was what you know what punch came to with a colonist for punch. You know, it came became punch. And so the colonial punch that they served at state events had five spices in it. All five spices came from India. And this was in the 1600s. And they just added some kind of fruit juice to it. 
like apple juice oh. or right <laughs> or maybe a little apple cider if we mm -hmm. want to make it a hard drink right. um but this is how early these spices and you know this interaction with you know India and the Mediterranean world was in the development of this country and what we even consider medicine these were already here at least I would say east of the Mississippi and into the south probably not on the west coast um, in the same way because that was settled so much later yeah. so, right so these herbs and spices are still considered part of the tradition because they were here at the beginning it was part of the fusion that we were talking about earlier mm. so these are you know the concepts of southern folk medicine are easy to pick up easy to understand and a lot of the plants you already know yeah i i, I uh in our my east west course uh i my students of course go to other other teachers as well and i actually encourage them to do that and uh yours would be one of the courses i'd say hey Go check out what Phyllis is doing. It's a little different, but but it, it, it it's congruent with what we're teaching here. It just is, we're, we're broaden your knowledge. So I I feel that too with all all the colleagues that I'm interviewing here. Uh, they're oh. they're great teachers, and they all have something to offer. And uh, and I I can I can lay a good foundation to my students, but I know that if they're really a good student, they're going to be looking at other places also. And, and I want to I want to set say, what the people that I'm interviewing say these are these are these are uh, teachers who I respect who are different. And if you're gonna look, wanna, wanna learn something different and, and have and, and know that, it, that it's congruent with what you've got as a foundation, this is where to go. And Phyllis is one of those people. Well, thank you. So thank you I, so much, Phyllis. Yeah, go ahead. I wanted to say one, one more thing is the Appalachians in this part of the South where I live actually used to be part of, oh God, it's big continent called, something asia i uh, gosh so, huh eurasia yeah was it eurasia or Atlantis or something? no well it's something i'll look it up in a sec but anyway this part of the south used to be part of china so oh. a tremendous number of the plants that grow where i live and that i use grow in China. And so I've discovered in the last few years that if I can get the Latin name of a Chinese plant, mm -hmm. and then I can take that Latin name and I can find the plant that grows here. So we have wild Shazandra, but we call it Magnolia vine. Wow. And of course, we have ginseng, they have ginseng, we have sumac, they have sumac, we have redbud, they have redbud. And so a lot of plant, a tremendous number of plants that is considered native Appalachian are native Chinese also. The species might be a little bit different, but still the basically the same family like redbud is exactly the same species, right. still considered native here. And it's amazing how many times what I might use it for, um, the plant for like redbud is something they would use it for in China. All right. So just do you do, you do much with Instagram? Yeah, a bit. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I just got onto it recently. I've, I've these one minute little shots where you go out and, and do a selfie with yourself with a plant and just talk a little bit about it. Yeah. Christopher Hobbs is doing a lot of that. I recommend that you, that you check out what Phyllis has to offer in that area because it's probably a good way to keep in touch with her and, and the plants that she she knows so well and where she lives. Well, thank I think, you. I think we've got that we've got got something here that I, that people are going to really enjoy, Phyllis. And th thank, I thank you. you so much for your time and and uh, for your uh, yeah your your the beauty of your teachings. Well, thank you. And thanks for having me. And it was really good to see your face. Yeah. Yeah. That's Missing what, seeing people. That's what we can do when we're not seeing each other in person. But anyways, terrific. Yeah. I love you, Phyllis. I love you too, sweetie. Bye-bye. <laughs>